Hello, I'm Philip Pound Baker and welcome to COVID Cryptography Bonus Edition. So it, what I was hoping to do today was to make a podcast on uh, message digest functions. Uh, but what I've got instead may be something more relevant, which is a proposal from Apple and Google that uses a form of message digest function in order to provide us with information about the COVID epidemic that current ha currently has us under lockdown. So what I want to do in this uh, podcast then is to describe what the proposal is and then look at does it actually work what, and what are the costs? What are the privacy costs and what are the other potential costs? And I think that we can just get rid of the third uh, question you know, pretty easily because looking at the, the uh, protocol, the performance impact on the user should be negligible as far as when they're uh, wandering around just doing their daily business. Uh, there is a computationally uh, burdensome step but that can be done overnight when the uh, cell phone is charging and I don't think that that should be a huge impact on the end user. And there are actually some uh, techniques that we could use that uh, if it becomes a problem we can use to minimise that. Uh, it's possible that there may end up being some patent infringement issues that come up. Uh, you know, I'm very sensitive to this because I work as a, an expert witness in patent cases uh, and as full disclosure you know I have actually done some work for Google. Um, so it is possible that somebody's going to raise their hand and say oh by the way you've got to give me a million dollars or a billion dollars for using this. Uh, that's always a risk with cryptography. Um, looking at the details of the specification uh, I'm pretty certain that none of my patents, uh, well, patents that are in my name but belong to other people, um, I don't think that those actually cover it because the claims uh, are for auth an authentication system. But if you look at the internals, uh, we do actually use many of the same techniques. They're well understood and well used in the industry. And so uh, I think that there's a pretty good chance of prior art, of prior art defense if it came to that. And in any case, uh, since the Def Defence Procurement Act has been activated in the US, which is the main jurisdiction in which an absurd patent um, award is a risk, well, that probably means that any award is going to end up being capped uh, by uh, the government. So it looks to me like we're on fairly safe ground as far as the other costs are concerned. So what is it? Well. This is where it gets tricky in that Apple and Google aren't really saying. Uh, the paper that they've got discussing the crypto is only actually six pages. There are no authors' names, which you know, probably wouldn't tell you much, but would tell me a great deal because you know, if you've worked with people for 20 years, you know, you know their sort of approach, you know their prejudices, you know where they're coming from. And so that doesn't really provide that, you know, I'd like to know who is involved. I can see why they're not revealing those names because um, you know they're just going to get slammed by the media demanding information. Yeah, I can guess uh, some of them but you know. And the other thing is that there's no address, email address in the paper to even send comments uh, about it which is a problem for me because usually I don't comment on stuff uh, you know t t in public first you know I, I like to go to the uh, developers and talk to them before talking about something in public. I can't do that here because they've just not left a contact address. As far as I, I can see, what this is intended to do is it allows a, an application to be de developed that is downloaded onto the phone or mobile device of the user and will allow the user of that device to discover if their phone has been in proximity to the phones of other people who have subsequently reported having been infected. And so it uses Bluetooth in order to do, communicate between the devices and it's intended to minimize the leakage information. So it's going to tell me the user of the device whether I have been infected and the objective is clearly to avoid 
telling anybody else anything if they can at all help it. And so what I'm going to be looking at is, you know, is that the right set of criteria? And also, have they actually achieved them? What it's not is it's not a, an application that's going to allow the authorities to tra trace people who may have been infected. It's not going to assist in any of the epidemiological studies and it's certainly not going to provide the type of capability that the Chinese authorities use to end their lockdown where the applications would say if somebody had been potentially infected and then they would be in enforced quarantine. Um, now what, so, so it's obviously not intended to do that, uh, but it may do that without, in, it, it may provide some information to uh, third parties that it doesn't intend to provide. Uh, it's going to be up to the details of the uh, implementation to see if that happens. And the reason for that is that security is a property of systems it's not a property of a single technology. And this is particularly the case with privacy, because I can have two sets of information that I can give you either of them without really telling you anything useful about me. But if I tell you both, I've told you exactly who I am. So um, there's about 70,000 people who live in each zip code in the United States. And there's roughly the same number of people who have a particular birthday in the United States. So if I tell you either of them, I'm not really giving you information that makes me stand out in a crowd. But if I give you both of them, I've told you everything. I've told you my address, which political parties I've donated to, I've given you the pho my phone numbers, uh, I've given you my shoe size, I've given you everything. And the reason for that is zip code and birthday are a unique identifier for 70% of the US population. And there are actually databases that you can buy on CD-ROM that contain all that other information linked to date of birth and zip code. And so if you give out two pieces of information on their own, which on their own don't reveal anything, the intersection between the two can give away everything. So privacy is a real difficult problem as far as security is concerned. So if, so I understand what Apple and Google appear to be doing, but there's another question on the horizon there. Is, you know, are, we, what, are we going to be able to lift the lockdown? Um, China was able to lift its lockdown in Wuhan after six to eight weeks. Uh, and one of the questions that's coming up everywhere is, you know, when are the US and Europe going to be allowed to do, able to do the same? You know, what level of contact tracing is necessary in order to prevent resurgences of the disease after the lockdown ends? And you know, how low do we have to flatten the curve? You know, is, do we have to get it down to one in a thousand, one in a hundred, ten, one? You know, we have to know whether lifting the lockdown, lifting the restrictions are going to cause another pandemic or not before we can do that. And this was a real problem in World War One, where in 1918, the Spanish flu, um, it was going throughout the summer or whatever, and it was tailing off. And then, when the World War I ended and the armistice was announced, people wanted to go out into the streets to celebrate, and that caused a huge resurgence of the pandemic, and a vast number of people died. And so we've got a dilemma here. You know, do we want to breach people's privacy? Do we want to prevent them from going out of the house? And, you know, they're both bad. And you know, crypto doesn't give you, uh, you know, crypto doesn't come with an attached morality. It just doesn't. So there are three types of app that could be produced. One is going to tell me whether I am infected. Another is going to provide anonymized information that tells the authorities how well. 
their control measures are doing in a particular region and whether they need to focus and you know, reimpose the lockdown in a particular locality on a temporary basis. And finally, there, there is the application that says, go, go to quarantine, go directly to quarantine, do not collect $200. And, you know, and the Chinese application was that third type. The Google Apple application is clearly of the first. It's only tell, going to tell me whether I have an incurable infectious disease. Uh, now, that's not much use now. However, it might be really useful if we end up with a therapeutic. And so there is some hopeful information on that. So, you know, not the nonsense chloroquine stuff that's now being debunked, but there is, the, 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 there are some other, uh, there's the Gilead stuff that uh, might possibly be a cure. You know, there isn't just one potential therapeutic out there being tested. There are dozens and, you know, if one of them turns out to be the one, well, then this application will turn out to be extremely useful and you will be very happy that you have downloaded it and started using it. We've also got to consider the alternative. So we've got to, there's a privacy issue in tracking people, but the alternative is, might be that we're locked in for a very long time and instead of getting out of our houses after six weeks, it might be six months. Uh, and so, you know, there's a real risk that uh, some of us are going to be asked to sacrifice some privacy uh, for some personal freedom. And this is perhaps a teachable moment because everybody's been doing that for the past 20 years without even being aware that they've been doing it. And not just through the internet. Um, like most people these days, I have a system on the car that tells me if one of the tires is, tires has low pressure in it and this is a really useful safety feature because you know tires that are underinflated are dangerous they also increase your uh, fuel consumption um, you know, having everybody run around with the correct tire pressure uh, would probably save more gas than uh, having everybody switch to a hybrid or at least a mild hybrid so that's a useful uh, piece of technology. But the problem is that the way that it was implemented didn't have to be this way. But the way that it was implemented, each one of the uh, tires has a transponder built into the cap that is continuously reporting out the pressure in that tire and the unique identifier of the tire to the rest of the world. And so that means that if you have a transponder, that, uh, a receiver that can read the signals these transponders are continuously broadcasting, you can track people. Didn't have to be that way, but that's the way that they chose to do it. Most of us accept uh, having a toll booth transponder. Uh, you know, it's much better driving through the uh, easy pass lane than to stop at the toll booth and hand over your money. Well, it turns out that, you know, for many years my wife was uh, very against having one of the transponders and I point out, well, you know, it doesn't make any difference privacy-wise. And the reason for that is that on every one of the toll booths there is a camera looking at the number plate of the car that records the number plate of every car that goes through and those are stored in a database and the reason why those are needed is because if you have a toll dodger fair dodger you've got to have some way of tracking them and they track them via the number plate and so in, uh, in Holland, in the Netherlands, they're very sensitive to privacy there. In the 1990s, they spent a huge amount trying to deploy this anonymous digital cash system designed by David Chow called DigiCash, and that was going to provide them with a way of paying their tolls without anybody being able to track people, uh, people's movements. Very sensitive to that in Holland because that was used uh, the records that the civil service had compiled in, in peacetime were used by the invaded Nazi forces uh, to track down Jews and murder them. 
So, terrific amount of concern for privacy, but completely futile because the complete system has to have the camera looking at the number plate in order to catch the fare dodgers. So, you know, again, crypto doesn't have a morality and neither does technology. Um, and you've got to look at the complete system when you're trying to work out what the privacy consequences of everything is. So for the past 20 years we've been blithely giving away our privacy to people without realising it. And now we've got a case where, well, maybe that trade-off would be a lot more worthwhile. You know, being able to go out of my house, I think I care about that a lot more than being told whether I need to inflate one of my tyres or not. But the thing is that now it's a conscious choice and before we were just doing it without being aware of what was going on. Okay, so uh, privacy lecture over. You know, how does this system work? Well, it uses what I'm going to call for the purpose of this presentation a one-way cryptographic function. So under the covers, it's actually using three different systems. One's a message digest, another is a key derivation code, key derivation function, and the final one's a message authentication code. As far as this presentation goes, I'm going to call them all one-way functions, and the important fact of them is that they're very easy to calculate in one way. You know, can calculate them without the computer barely knowing that it's doing some calculations. But going the other way is next to impossible. It would take far more computing resources than is avail are available on all the computers in all the world and still wouldn't provide you with uh, useful information. So the important fact here is that they're one way. You can calculate them easily in one way, but expensive in the other way uh, because the work factor of going reversing the function is very high and if you have watched the first uh, one of these podcasts on work factor you know, the work factor of this particular system is well considerably greater than we need to worry about uh, as far as uh, as far as somebody breaking the crypto goes if somebody's going to break it break the system it's not going to be the crypto they're going to break and Looking through the implementation choices they've made, you know, they're using industry standard al algorithms throughout. It's all very vanilla crypto. It's all stuff that has been published for many years, has been widely researched, widely implemented, widely applied. And it's also state-of-the-art stuff. You know, these are the algorithms and the constructs that we are using in the very latest protocols that we're designing. This isn't stuff that, you know, is 20 years old that we're kind of a bit worried about. This is all stuff that is, uh, I would have no problem using in uh, my systems. In fact, I'm using the exact same set of crypto constructs and algorithms in my system, the mathematical mesh. So this is like if you buy a car and, you know, a new body, you know, that's one thing. But, you know, you know, you can be the first person on your street with that, you know, all new uh, Honda Odyssey or Sienna or whatever. You know, that's great. Being the first person on your street or in the world with that new engine that they've just come out with, <laughs> that would be a different thing entirely, you know, because there you might be uh, an early adopter. Uh, so, you know, they're not doing that to us. This is crypto. These are crypto engines that are very well understood, very well explored. So the principle of operation is pretty straightforward. Every device, when you download the app and uh, install it, generates a unique tracing key. And this is unique to the device and it is generated using a pseudo-random number generator and it's got 256 bits, which is more than a satisfactory work factor uh, for the problem. Every day, this device uh, generates a new daily tracing key from the master tracing key and the current day in the Unix calendar. Um, the, 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 
uh, the background here is that as far as Unix is concerned, time started uh, 1st of January 1970, I think it was, and if you, they have a way of counting the days since. And so this is going to change its code every day. Uh, and the code that it generates, the daily tracing key, uh, that stays on the device except if the user reports being infected. I'll come to that uh, in a moment. So, the, in, normal, in normal circumstances, your daily tracing key is never revealed to anybody else. The only time that the daily, tra the, 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 the only thing that you reveal is a rolling proximity identifier that is generated by the device from the daily tracing key, again using a one-way function. So there's a one-way function from the unit tracing key to the daily tracing key, a second one-way function from the daily tracing key to the rolling proximity identifier. And the rolling proximity identifier is generated every time, uh, regenerated every time this device changes its Bluetooth configuration. When Bluetooth first came out, one of the complaints I and others had about it, same problem we had with Wi-Fi, was that it, each device has a unique code that was installed during the, in the factory and was broadcast to all the rest of the world in the clear, you know, as a plain text, uh, all the time that device was operating. So it was giving out an enormous amount of privacy-sensitive information. And, you know, that was just ridiculous. The new system, so, so about you know, five years ago we started complaining about that, and so what's come in more recently is that the unique identifiers for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are supposed to rotate on a regular basis so that each time I uh, turn on the phone it should have a different Bluetooth identifier, and that should change every hour or so. And so your rolling proximity identifiers for the COVID app are going to change every time your Bluetooth configuration changes. And so that prevents the Bluetooth uh, identifier being a um, linking identifier for your rolling proximity identifier or vice versa. They're both going to change at the same time. What's not mentioned here is whether your Wi-Fi and your Bluetooth MAC addresses are going to roll at the same time. I think that they should, but we don't know. So the rolling proximity identifier is being broadcast out to all and sundry and so this device as I, as I step out into the world it's going to be recording all the rolling proximity identifiers from the rest of the world and storing them in the log. And so if I go out for a walk, uh, you know, if I see 10 people I would have 10 and they're all using the app, well I've now got 10 rolling proximity identifiers in my uh, log. Okay, so what do I do with that? Well, this comes back to the daily tracking keys, daily tracing keys. If somebody is infected, they open the app and they say, well I've been infected and this is when I think I, it started, uh, this is when I stopped being infectious, and they upload that set, they upload load their daily tracing keys for just those days. And though the potentially infectious uh, tracing keys, those are called diagnosis keys. And so if you have uh, a million people using the app and a thousand of them are infected, well, there will be a thousand keys for each, you know, a thousand times seven, seven thousand diagnosis keys appearing on the diagnosis server. Now, those diagnosis keys don't actually say anything by themselves because they don't actually allow you to link one user to another. The only thing that allows you to link the users are the rolling proximity codes which are only output by the devices itself and only on Bluetooth, that is only on a near-ish field communication uh, band. So the only way that you can use this for linking one person to another is if you were close enough to that individual's device 
in order to capture that key. And so the idea is that each night uh, when you put the phone on to charge, it downloads the updates from the diagnosis server, it churns through all the log of the uh, rolling proximity identifiers that it's recorded, and it checks to see if any of them would, uh, any of the diagnosis keys that were reported would have resulted in something that would have been a match. And so this is actually a fairly computation expensive thing. If you've got 10,000 diagnosis, diagnosis keys and 10 items in your log, well, you've got 100,000 matches to check. If you have a million diagnosis keys and 1,000 uh, proximity identifiers, well, you've got a billion to check. So, well, a billion is actually maybe within the, you know, I have to do the math, but, but yeah, you know, if you, uh, but if you go out there and you're interacting with a thousand different people, uh, well, you're probably going to get the disease anyway, um, you know, just because you're being careless. So, there's probably some limits here, self limits. So the question that I don't have an answer to from the specs, and you know, I've read the six pages on the crypto, and then there's an API spec, and then there's another spec. What they don't really tell me is what the user interface is going to look like. You know, how is this information going to be communicated to the user? Is it going to be communicated in a form that uh, is only readable by that user? Or is it going to be communicated uh, as a green or red code? I mean, in the Chinese system, uh, your phone, if it's green, you can get to work, you can get onto the subway, you can go to the supermarket. If it's red, well, you're staying at home. Well, maybe that's the system we should be building. Alternatively, uh, another way that you could do it would be when you install the app, you could choose a uh, disclosure phrase, you know, Freddy likes peanuts, and if you've been infected, it will give you that phrase back, and otherwise it will give you something else. And so you're only going to see, instead of it saying you've been infected, it will give you a message that only you can interpret. So there are implementation choices there that I don't see from the specifications. So does it work? Well, I think that it works as far as the limited objectives that Apple and Google are setting for themselves. If enough people download it, install it and use it, it's certainly going to tell them if they've been potentially infected and if we get to the point where there's a therapeutic, effective therapeutic, that information is going to be very useful. Is it going to work, though, in terms of lifting the pandemic? And I think that, you know, lifting the lockdown, I think the answer there is almost certainly not, in that it's not, it, it represents the extreme compromise between privacy and reporting. You know, it's all the way to privacy. It's not going to provide um, much information that could be used for uh, improving our epidemiological studies. And it's not, certainly not going to provide a way of enforcing targeted quarantine. So, you know, that is a choice. It's probably the choice that I would make. Uh, it's not necessarily the choice that gets us out of the lockdown. Another question that comes up is, is it robust? Well, I think that the system, as it is specified, it looks like they've looked at the potential linkages uh, that are intentionally on the application. What is maybe not being looked at sufficiently is what other applications running on the phone might be broadcasting identifiers that would become linkable. And the problem there is that uh, if somebody's playing, say, Pokemon Go, and that's throwing out one of these signals, and then somebody's entering their apartment, well, you might have a situation where the other apps on the phone, in combination with this COVID awareness app, 
is link leaking the fact that somebody's been infected to the other people that they're living with. And that could be a problem. So I don't think that the system as defined is providing a privacy violation. We've got to be sensitive, however, to the possibility that this system, in combination with others, may blow a hole in privacy, just as birth date and zip code doesn't blow a hole in privacy, but both certainly do. The linkability is limited to those 24-hour intervals. Uh, you know, it's pretty good. It's also, and I really like this, uh, I have to wonder if Motti Young was involved here, because the spec make, takes great pains to point out that it is side-channel free. What do I mean by that? Well, there's a particular type of uh, malicious cryptography called kleptography, where what you try to do is you give somebody a crypto system that works exactly as they expect, but all the time is secretly and surreptitiously passing out a bunch of information under the covers that somebody with some other bits of information allows them to work out stuff that they shouldn't. A uh, canonical example of this is um, the way that certain diplomatic ciphers have been broken in the past where the country that was targeted was persuaded to buy their crypto hardware from a vendor that was being run by a hostile intelligence agency and that crypto hardware was set up so that when it started a communication and as you often do you generate what looks like a random number, well, you pass the uh, secret key along with the random number. So that's called the side channel and it, it is a very active concern when we design cryptographic protocols. I have to say that the Google Apple proposal uh, has considered this and pretty much eliminated all scope for uh, surreptitiously passing information under the covers. It would, it would require a very large amount of work on the part of the attacker to be passing that information. What about attacks? Well, um, it's pretty robust as far as confidentiality and integrity go. Uh, the main concern is not this application on its own, it's what might happen if you are running this app with others. One area where it might have issues is a, in what we call a denial of service attack and there might be an issue here where you get people deliberately trying to bring down the system by falsely reporting that they've been infected and reporting a ridiculous number of, um, uh, you know, making sure that they've been circulating really widely in the population and then establishing it so that uh, a ridiculous number of people open their app and discover that they've been infected or alternatively their app, you know, they open their phone in the morning and it says still processing because so many diagnosis keys have been reported it just can't cope with them all. So there is a potential there uh, and you know we are seeing, you know, even in these crisis times we are seeing hostile actors out there that are deliberately trying to break the system. You know, uh, whenever you do something in crypto, there are always the number of the beast crowd out there saying that uh, this is some hidden agenda, there's some really, something really bad going on. Uh, you know, there's folk who are now burning down uh, cellular towers. Uh, believing that they're 5G's, no, none of the ones you've set fire to so far happen to be. Um, you know, there are incredibly stupid people out there. That might possibly be an issue. Another potential, uh, more like, you know, another potential vector is uh, the number of people reporting they've been infected might be used as pretext for some um, government clampdown measures. Uh, we've already seen, uh, while I was writing, between me writing these slides and taping them, uh, we had a, a, what's effectively a coup in Brazil when the army said to the president, you know, you're really not up to this, are you? And relieved him of uh, command. 
and so now he's you know doing nothing and the general's in charge um, we might have an attempt to delay or cancel an election and you know it's possible that reports from one of these applications might be used as pretext to uh, establish uh, that the rate of infection suddenly blossom, suddenly hugely increased. The answer there though is pretty much as long as we're aware of the fact that this is self-reported data and we should not be trusting it because it is self-reported, those sorts of malicious pretextual approaches should be blocked. Um, so it's awareness is the cure there. Uh, are the privacy costs? Well, as far as the direct privacy costs, as I explained, this, this system is not telling an observer anything about the rolling proximity codes it's collecting unless somebody has reported themselves as potentially infectious. If somebody has reported themselves as potentially infectious and somebody only has one person in their log and they know who that is, well, in that case, um, they know that that person's potentially infectious. Um, so there is a small privacy leakage there due to the low end of the study. Uh, in most cases, however, that shouldn't be too much of a worry. Uh, the, the bigger worry is the indirect uh, privacy loss where information from this system is correlated by all the other electronic clots and jetsam that were spewing into the environment continuously. Privacy costs from the diagnosis key collections are pretty well nil because those, you know, the daily tracing keys say nothing by themselves. You can have all the daily tracing keys from all the users in, in the world and that will tell you nothing about how they interact. That information is only in the uh, rolling proximity. Uh, identifiers. But by the same uh, token, because it reveals nothing, we're not getting any epidemiological information from this collection and we're not going to get the ability to do targeted quarantine. So in summary, this is a system that does almost exactly what it is intended to do. Uh, it does it, it is extremely robust um, provided the number of observations uh, are sufficiently large and provided the, um, the user isn't unintentionally giving out other information that might be identifying themselves, uh, this is going to protect the user's privacy and mean that when they open their app, you know, that can tell them whether they've been potentially infected or not. It's not going to tell anybody else. And that could be very useful if we get to a therapeutic because, you know, knowing who needs that therapeutic could be very important. What it's not going to do is to provide us with better epidemiological information and it isn't going to enable targeted quarantine. And those are clearly design choices that have been taken by the designers. Um, whether those are the correct ones or not are something that uh, the users and governments are going to have to decide for themselves. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, in my next podcast I will hopefully come to Message Digests again as I originally intended and we're going to look at um, how those work and from, a, from the point of view of you know, cryptography. So thank you very much for watching this bonus edition of COVID Cryptography and please click like, please click subscribe and please uh, stay around for the full COVID Cryptography course uh, where I'm going to try and inform and entertain showing you how to do real cryptography. Thank you very much.